thanks everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. I appreciate you uh, carving out time from your schedules to take part in this webinar series. I want to begin with just a quick introduction so you can put a name with the floating head that you may uh, be seeing on your, uh, your screen today. My name is Jacob White. I am joining you today from the beautiful campus of Ohio University where I work as a senior executive in residence for the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs. I am a formally trained scientist. Uh, my degrees are in the field of chemistry and I previously worked uh, with a 15 year career in science education, uh, during which time I enjoyed uh, quite a few opportunities to collaborate with K-12 science teachers in uh, providing PD opportunities. Uh, in an effort to help Ohio University reestablish the Southeast hub of the Ohio STEM Learning Network, I have put together a webinar series uh, that will consist of three one hour sessions uh, that are designed for science teachers of any grade level. Uh, and the focus will be uh, essentially as a, a primer on pedagogy associated with inquiry-based science instruction. Uh, the two general objectives I have in, in offering uh, this series is to strengthen uh, teachers' understanding of science inquiry as a pedagogy and uh, in general enhance overall pedagogical uh, knowledge of science teaching. There will be three one-hour sessions offered. Uh, the registration uh, is open for the sessions individually or as a whole, as, as an entire series. Uh, there's coherence between the three, but I'm going to do my best to, uh, to facilitate the sessions as standalone offerings. So if you're unable to attend all three, uh, the registration will still be open on an individual basis. Uh, today's session, uh, session one, will provide a foundation for understanding and thinking about the teaching of science through uh, pedagogy of uh, inquiry. The second session will provide examples of how teachers could take science lessons and make very small, subtle shifts that intend to promote an increased degree of student inquiry. Uh, the third session, which will be offered in March, will be uh, more of a working session uh, in which uh, attendees will have the opportunity to practice uh, applying their own shifts to lesson plans uh, to share these ideas with, uh, with other attendees to uh, engage in discourse and get professional feedback from, uh, from colleagues. Uh, with that, I want to provide a, an overview of, of today's one-hour session. I want to provide a working definition of inquiry and uh, scientific inquiry, especially as it applies to a pedagogy for teaching uh, science. I'm also going to spend most of the time uh, overviewing a framework uh, for understanding different modes of classroom teaching with respect to science inquiry. This framework uh, is something that I discovered and have found to be very helpful in uh, helping uh, to think about teaching through inquiry uh, and very helpful in framing discussion with colleagues regarding teaching strategies. Uh, this framework will include uh, quite a few classroom examples uh, of uh, science lessons presented uh, within the context of, of this, uh, this framework. And as a wrap up, I, I have just a, a few take home messages that I wanna uh, emphasize and uh, including uh, some comments regarding how this framework that I'll be sharing really addresses common misconceptions, uh, misconceptions that I held early in my teaching career regarding uh, student inquiry. Um, and how this will inform uh, some of what we do in the next, uh, the next webinar series. Uh, so with that, I want to ask a first polling question. 
and uh, you should see on your screen uh, an interactive poll, and I'm asking uh, which of the following best describes your experience uh, with inquiry-based teaching strategies. Uh, on the low end, I have no experience using these strategies, not really sure what is meant uh, by the term inquiry-based teaching strategies. Uh, on the high end is a significant experience, which would mean uh, you have employed these strategies uh, quite often and feel confident uh, in your, your usage of these strategies. Okay, I'll give you just a moment to complete the poll. I have a few more changes coming in. And at this time, if you're having any, uh, any trouble accessing the poll, uh, please message Mackenzie and, and she can try to help troubleshoot any issues you might be experiencing. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So what I'm seeing on my end is uh, quite a variety of experience levels with inquiry-based teaching. Uh, some attendees have uh, little to no experience, some have significant experience and a bit of a bell curve in responses uh, with the majority being in the middle, minimal to moder moderate uh, experience. That's helpful uh, for me to know. Uh, I'll frame some of the presentation uh, in response to, uh, to those results. I also wanted to use this as an introduction to the polling feature. Later in the presentation, I'm gonna ask for you to uh, answer a few polling questions as a learning check uh, for uh, one aspect of today's training. And with that, uh, we will begin today's discussion. What is inquiry? Well, if you're like me and similar to most of our students, uh, when a question emerges, we often hop online and uh, Google a question. When I type in what is inquiry, one of the first Google responses that I come to is from Merriam-Webster, uh, which presents a colloquial usage of the term inquiry. Inquiry has three common uses. It is a request for information, a systematic investigation, often of a matter of public interest. And a third common usage of the term inquiry is an examination into facts or principles. This is most closely aligned to how we use the term inquiry in relationship to science. It's a synonym with the term reference. These common uses of the term inquiry emphasize that inquiry is a process. It is a reference to a process. When we tack on the term scientific inquiry, what is scientific inquiry? Uh, we carry over the same emphasis. Scientific inquiry uh, emphasizes the process of doing science. It is the act of doing science. The act of doing science well involves several steps. We associate that with the scientific method and those steps along the way involve process skills, skills associated with uh, each of these steps. I'm summarizing these steps for the sake of today's webinar. These process skills can be uh, articulated as asking questions, planning and conducting experiments, analyzing data to draw conclusions, and the skill of being able to communicate results to others. These process skills are referenced as scientific inquiry. Students are expected to develop these process skills throughout their educational experience in the K-12 setting. These process skills are found in the state science standards, both uh, emphasized in a general sense, as well as articulated uh, specifically at each particular uh, grade level. In the front matter of the state science standards, we see these uh, science inquiry skills emphasized as scientific and engineering practices. This is uh, a set of principles that the Ohio Department of Education adopted from the National Research Council as a guide uh, leading their development of the uh, new or current science standards. 
these practices are articulated with a bit more detail than what I summarized before, but the essence is, uh, is the same. Asking questions, planning and conducting experiments, analyzing data to draw conclusions, and communicating results. These skills are emphasized in the state science standards, uh, both in a general manner applicable uh, throughout the pre-K through 12 curriculum, but also specifically within the new section of the state science standards called the nature of science. This is a new section uh, found in the state science standards. This was not uh, a component of the old science standards. And within this new section, there's a category termed scientific inquiry, practice and applications, where explicit expectations for students to develop and demonstrate science inquiry uh, skills are articulated. This is an example uh, applicable to the K through grade two curriculum, uh, where these skills are, are further articulated. And at other grade levels, the expectations become uh, differentiated uh, further. So if the development of science inquiry skills is clearly an expectation within the uh, science standards, uh, it becomes a very common question for science educators to, uh, to ask is how do students develop these skills and how should we as educators teach such that students are likely to develop these skills? Well, the term teaching through inquiry is an attempt to accomplish that. Uh, it's an attempt to teach in a way that results in students developing inquiry skills associated with the scientific process. Teaching through inquiry is any teaching strategy that gives students responsibility for applying and therefore practicing the process skills of science. Teaching through inquiry would be any teaching strategy that forces students to practice any or all of the science inquiry skills. Asking questions, planning and conducting experiments, analyzing data to draw conclusions, or communicating the results of an investigation uh, to others. These skills build throughout the science curriculum and the expectations also build, where students at an early grade level uh, may be expected to, uh, in terms of asking questions, first engage in observations about the natural world, then in later grades, uh, begin formulating questions about the natural world, which then could transition into upper grades as being able to ask researchable questions and to distinguish researchable questions from questions that are not suitable for scientific investigation. Uh, I'm summarizing these skills uh, here for the sake of uh, today's presentation. But please understand these inquiry skills uh, do uh, vary by grade level. In many conversations I've had with teachers uh, providing professional development opportunities, I've had uh, very rich discussions and insight emerge uh, from this common question. Teachers often ask if developing inquiry skills is an essential component of uh, the science standards, how do I know if my science lessons are inquiry based? Are my teaching strategies uh, likely to result in students developing inquiry skills? Well, in having these discussions with teachers, I came across a framework that presents the notion of student inquiry and teaching strategies uh, in, a, in a manner that was very helpful for me to understand the process and also very helpful to frame discussions with colleagues uh, surrounding lesson plan development or curriculum design. I wanna share this framework with you uh, today 
It is not a framework that I developed. I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, this is a framework that was developed uh, by researchers at Western Michigan University uh, through a project titled Pedagogy of Science Teaching, uh, referred to by the acronym POST. And it is a theoretical framework for understanding inquiry-based teaching. Uh, it is one of several frameworks for understanding inquiry and teaching strategies. I find it helpful because it is generally applicable across all grade levels and across all science content areas. The main idea of this framework and a misconception that it addressed for me uh, that I harbored early in my career is the notion that we should think of inquiry-based instruction as being not dichotomous. In other words, when we think about teaching strategies, it's less helpful to think about them as being either inquiry-based or not inquiry-based. That is what I mean by dichotomous. Inquiry-based instruction should not be thought of as being dichotomous. Instead, uh, this framework suggest that for any given science lesson, it can be more helpful to consider that the degree of student inquiry uh, actually exists across a spectrum, across a continuous spectrum of varying degrees, where on the low end, a lesson plan uh, may result in no student inquiry. On the high end, a lesson plan may result in full or complete student inquiry. Those two extremes may be true, but it is often far more helpful to consider everything in between. Those variations in between the two extremes of what students are doing in terms of applying inquiry skills uh, it is very important to consider and it can help to inform the development of lesson plans and it can help to frame discussion with colleagues surrounding science lesson plans. I've tried to develop a, a visual to help understand this framework. Uh, it presents student inquiry, so what they are actually doing during a science lesson as existing across the spectrum. We're on the left side of this visualization less student inquiry is being represented. On the right side of the spectrum, more student inquiry is, is being represented. I wanna emphasize that this framework is not prescriptive. So please don't interpret this as suggesting a lesson plan that falls on the left of the spectrum is a worse lesson plan, or that a lesson plan following on the right side of the spectrum is a better lesson plan that is not intended uh, as part of this framework. Instead, it's just providing a description of science lesson plans with respect to student inquiry. The researchers who developed this framework offered four terms that classify different types of instruction relative to this idea of lesson plans existing across a varying degree of student inquiry. On the low end of the uh, inquiry spectrum, a lesson plan can be described as didactic direct if it involves uh, little to no student inquiry. This type of lesson plan could be characterized as a teacher presenting and explaining science content directly to students, providing illustrations, uh, examples, or even demonstrations to the students. But the students are engaged in no activities themselves. They are passive recipients of content instruction being provided by the teacher. This is one classification of teaching strategies that would represent uh, the lower amount of student inquiry. Next on this spectrum, we have modes of teaching or teaching strategies uh, that are uh, characterized as active, direct teaching strategies. This type of instruction could be characterized as a teacher presenting and explaining science content directly, providing illustrations, examples, or demonstrations to students, but the students are engaged in some activity 
that activity is fully instructed by the teacher. Uh, these are often step-by-step -step instructions where students are confirming or verifying what a teacher has already explained. We have didactic direct, having very little student inquiry, active direct instruction, having more student inquiry. A third classification uh, that can be helpful to think of in this framework is guided inquiry. Guided inquiry is a mode of instruction characterized by students actively exploring phenomenon or content or ideas with teacher guidance towards a desired science content outcome. A distinguishing feature of guided inquiry is the term exploration. Students are given an increasing degree of discretion to choose either what it is that they're doing, what question they're exploring, or how they are seeking uh, information to answer a, a particular question. These are three modes of instruction that really present the spectrum uh, in, uh, in, in these segments. A fourth category uh, that we'll work with within this framework is termed open inquiry. Of the four, open inquiry is a mode of instruction that involves the most student responsibility for applying inquiry skills. Open inquiry would refer to any lesson plan in which the students are actively participating. They are exploring phenomenon or content areas as they choose. They're giving uh, far, far more discretion uh, to uh, dictate the nature of, of that lesson plan experience. Teachers are still present and facilitating uh, the process, but the teacher is not prescribing or instructing uh, specific steps within the process. Now, if we look at this framework, for me, what was uh, most helpful and insightful was just realizing that prior to seeing this framework and thinking uh, about student inquiry in this manner, really what I thought of when I heard teaching through inquiry was either all the way to the left or all the way to the right. In my mind, the notion of teaching through inquiry uh, was quite dichotomous. Uh, lesson plan either required students to engage in inquiry or it did not. After I saw this framework, I realized that was a, that was a misconception that I had and that it can be very beneficial to instead think of all of the nuances in uh, student engagement that actually exist on this spectrum in between the two extremes. Understanding those nuances and thinking about them gave me a, a lot of ideas for how I could take any science lesson that I, I already had available to me and make small subtle tweaks that may force students uh, to practice inquiry skills just in, an, in a small increased degree. I found that very insightful and in providing uh, an overview of this framework, I, I hope it gives a new perspective to you and, uh, and maybe spur some creative ideas as, uh, as well. I now want to uh, show some classroom examples of lesson plans that span this spectrum uh, within the research that led to this framework uh, out of uh, Western Michigan University. Uh, the researchers offer these classroom snapshots uh, as examples of how traditional science lessons could be structured and delivered in these varied manners. These are referred to as classroom vignettes. This is the first vignette. Mr. Goodchild is designing a frog dissection lesson for his eighth graders to help teach them about anatomy. This is a very common uh, science topic area, uh, particularly in the middle school grades. And there are quite a variation of how this lesson plan could be designed and delivered to students. And those variations will involve uh, quite a different degree of student inquiry. If we take that lesson plan idea and apply it to this framework, 
We have on the low end, this is one example of didactic direct instruction. It could be taught as a step-by-step -step demonstration while the teacher explicitly points out to students what they need to know about frog anatomy. Now, again, this is not suggesting that that form of the lesson plan is better than or worse than another. It's just presenting an example of how the degree of student inquiry really varies across the spectrum. This would be an example of the lesson designed as didactic direct instruction. An example of the lesson plan structured as active direct instruction would be student pairs following step-by-step -step instructions to perform the dissection on their own after the teacher explains to them exactly what they need to know about frog anatomy. This would be active instruction. The students would be actively participating, but they would be exclusively following instructions and confirming conclusions that they were told to look for uh, in advance of the lesson uh, and activity itself. A third variation of this lesson as a guided inquiry example is that it could be taught as a step-by-step -step student activity while students are answering probing questions, not confirmational uh, questions, but probing questions with the activity uh, followed up by teacher-led discussion and clarifications. Subtle difference between active direct, uh, but significant in terms of what inquiry skills students would be applying in this variation compared with didactic or active direct modalities. A fourth variation of the same lesson plan is that it could be taught as a step-by-step -step activity, but allowing students to explore the frog's anatomy and to raise discussion questions of interest uh, on their own. All four of these are, are very traditional. I am not presenting them uh, as one of them being better or best, uh, just to illustrate that the degree to which students are applying inquiry skills or the process skills associated with science can vary wildly. Uh, such that it really can be uh, far more beneficial to think of student inquiry as existing across the spectrum instead of thinking it in a dichotomous manner. This is the first classroom vignette. I also want to share a, a few more and then ask you uh, to apply this as a quick learning check. Here's the second classroom vignette. Ms. Katinka is teaching her second grade class about the concept of volume. That could be quite a challenge. Second graders thinking about uh, such an abstract idea as volume. The classroom has available jars of different shapes and sizes, as well as beans for filling the jars. This teacher is considering variations uh, of lesson plans for this uh, specific topic. If we apply that science lesson and topic uh, to this framework of thinking about inquiry, the lesson could be designed as didactic direct instruction in which the teacher demonstrates to the class by counting how many beans can fit in two different size jars. Then the teacher explains how the beans can serve as a way for comparing the amount of space or volume inside the jars. That's a very common lesson plan design. Within this framework, it would be categorized as didactic direct instruction. A variation of the lesson plan as active direct instruction could be that the teacher explains that the beams can be used as a way of comparing the amount of space or volume inside the jars and then students are given two different size jars and instructed to count how many beans can fit in each. Very small variation in the lesson plan, but in one modality, students uh, are passive recipients uh, of the teacher's instruction. In the other, they are active yet fully instructed as what to do. A third variation is guided inquiry would be for the teacher to distribute the beans in different size jars to students 
then the students are asked to come up with a way to determine and compare the amount of space inside the different jars. Afterwards, the teacher then defines the term volume. Slight variation, uh, but in terms of what students uh, would be doing as applying inquiry skills, uh, an important difference. And lastly, this lesson plan, if it was delivered uh, and designed as an open inquiry modality, the lesson plan could be that the teacher first allows students to experiment by filling beans into the jars of different sizes and shapes. And then the teacher elicits student ideas about what the different number of beans is actually describing about the different jars that are used. Uh, so subtle difference, but important in terms of what students are having to apply and practice. Uh, by participating in, in the lesson plan. Okay, that was a second vignette. I want to provide a third vignette, uh, and this is probably my favorite uh, of the three, because it illustrates how this framework, this, this notion of how we can think about student inquiry and the process skills students are practicing during a lesson can apply to an experimental type of lesson or a broader type of lesson such, such as this. Miss Piper is taking her third grade class to the local nature center. Because they are currently studying food web, she would like to use the field trip as a way to learn more about this topic. So this would be an example of a lesson plan that doesn't really fit the traditional science experiment uh, type of lesson plan. This is a field trip. The framework of thinking about student inquiry could still be applied to designing this, uh, this ex uh, experience for students. If we take that topic and apply it to the framework, uh, we have the following variations of how uh, this lesson could be structured. As a didactic approach, it could be structured such that during the field trip, the teacher points out and explains to the class every example of food web interactions that are encountered at the Nature Center. Again, this is not suggesting that's the wrong approach to a lesson plan design, just illustrating how this lesson could really vary uh, uh, quite wildly. That would be an example of a didactic approach. An active yet directed approach uh, as a variation could be that before the field trip, the teacher provides students with a checklist of specific examples of food webs. And then during the field trip, students are asked to mark off each example that they encounter. Students are actively engaged, but fully instructed. Uh, this would be a subtle variation of the same, uh, same lesson plan. A variation that would fall more in the guided inquiry uh, uh, area of the spectrum would be during the field trip, students are asked to make a list of all the food web interactions that they encounter uh, while at the nature center. Students share their observations at a later time and discuss as a group. Very subtle difference between the active direct example and the guided inquiry example. Students are not given the checklist in the guided inquiry example. They are given a checklist in the active direct example. Uh, subtle differences, uh, but these subtle differences can have uh, meaningful impacts on what students uh, are expected to do during the lesson and how they're practicing uh, particular process skills. The fourth variation of this field trip example as open inquiry would be during the field trip, students are asked to make a list of anything they found interesting while at the Nature Center. Afterwards, the class discusses if anything uh, related to food webs was observed. So far more open-ended, students are given far more discretion to, uh, to, to guide their experience, uh, to ask questions, to engage uh, in the outcomes uh, as well. These are four examples of a field trip lesson plan structure. 
They are not exclusive. There are many other examples of how we could structure this field trip in a didactic way or in an active way or in a guided inquiry way. There are many other examples of how this could be structured as an open inquiry uh, approach. Again, I'm not trying to emphasize one modality is better than any other modality. I'm trying to emphasize that science teaching with respect to inquiry uh, is helpful to consider as existing across the spectrum uh, of varying degrees of, of student, uh, um, student inquiry. Those were three examples that I've articulated. I'm now gonna ask you to uh, apply this using the polling feature. I have two more uh, examples. Uh, I'm gonna explain two of the categories, but then I'm gonna have you uh, identify uh, the remaining two uh, modalities. So here is the next vignette. Ms. Brandt is preparing a lesson to introduce her fifth grade students to the relationship between force and motion. Namely, that a net force will cause an object to speed up or slow down. Now that is uh, in essence, Newton's second law. Uh, so this lesson is focusing on force and motion and the classroom has available in it, a loaded wagon to which a pulling force can be applied. The teacher is considering how this lesson could be structured and implemented with students. If we apply this to the inquiry spectrum, I'm gonna give you the two extremes, and then I'm gonna ask you through a polling question to identify the others. On the low end of student inquiry, as an example of didactic instruction, the lesson could be structured such that Newton's second law is first written on the board and then explained to students and the teacher could demonstrate the law by pulling on a loaded wagon with a constant force as students observe the motion. That would be a didactic approach to the lesson plan. On the far end of the spectrum, as an open inquiry example, we could consider the teacher could raise the question of whether there's any relationship between force and motion. And then students are given the opportunity to freely, yet safely, explore uh, this question using any of the materials available to them in the classroom with a uh, class-wide discussion uh, following where students share their results and conclusions. Okay, so those would be the two ends of the spectrum uh, for this lesson plan. I'm now gonna ask you a polling question. As a learning check, which of these two options would be best classified as an active direct modality for this lesson plan. First, Newton's second law is written on the board and explained to students. Then students are instructed to verify the law by pulling on a loaded wagon themselves and to confirm the type of motion that results. Is that active direct instruction or is this second option active direct instruction? students are given a loaded wagon and asked to explore the question of what kind of motion results from a constant force. From their evidence, the students would then propose a possible law. Those are your two options. I am going to pull up uh, this next polling question and ask you to answer. Which of the following would be best classified as active direct instruction? I am seeing your results. I'm gonna share on the screen in just a moment. Give you five more seconds. If you wanna answer, go ahead and submit your answer. And I will stop the polling. Very good, uh, class results. Uh, for your participation, uh, about 80% uh, got this one right. The first option was active direct. And I'll close that polling feature and come back here. Active direct would be the first option. Uh, the content is first explained to the students, then students are given the opportunity to actively participate uh, in 
uh, in the lesson to verify conclusions that were uh, previously provided to them. Uh, it is active, but it is fully directed at the teacher's instructions. As guided inquiry, the second variation uh, would be the better fit uh, in that students are allowed to explore the question uh, with little uh, to, uh, to no instruction or, uh, or constraints uh, by step-by-step -step process uh, described by the teacher. Uh, so that was a fourth classroom vignette as an example. I have one more uh, to uh, to give as an example, and we'll take the same process. I'll explain the example, give you the two ends of the spectrum, and then ask you to identify uh, the modality uh, in the middle. This last vignette uh, is concerning magnetism. Mr. Golden has introduced the topic of magnetism to his first grade students. And they have learned that bar magnets attract certain kinds of materials that have iron in them. For today's new lesson, he has available bar magnets and a variety of food containers made of plastic, iron, aluminum, steel, and glass. Mr. Golden is considering different lesson plan designs. With respect to student inquiry, a lesson plan that would be characterized as didactic direct instruction might be similar to this example. The teacher first reminds the class that magnets attract materials which contain iron and then shows them how the bar magnets attract the containers made of iron, but not any of the other containers. The instructor is providing explanation uh, giving a demonstration, but the teachers are passive recipients uh, of that instruction. On the far end of the spectrum, an example illustrating an open inquiry approach might be that students are provided with a bar magnet and the various kinds of food containers that are available in the classroom. The teacher does not outline a specific task, but asks them to find out what they can about the collection and then report back their observations and conclusions. That would be an example of an open inquiry lesson plan design. I'm now gonna ask you to take the same approach with the polling feature as a learning check. Which of the following would be best classified as guided inquiry instruction? Option one. The teacher first reminds the class that magnets attract materials which contain iron. Then small groups of students are instructed to use bar magnets to sort the food containers into those which do contain iron and those which do not. That would be one lesson plan mode or the second option. Students are told to think about how to solve the puzzle of which food containers contain iron and which do not. They would either come up with or be prompted to use bar magnets to test the various kinds of food containers. One of these examples is active direct instruction. The other one is guided inquiry. The learning check is asking which of these is guided inquiry instruction. I'm going to pull up this last polling question. I hope you can see it on your screen. Yes, the results are starting to come in now. Which of these is guided inquiry? All right, I'll give you five more seconds. If you want to submit an answer, please do so. And then I will share the results. Three, two, one, last call for polling. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. These were almost identical, 80% answered this one correctly as well. The second description would be the better classification as guided inquiry instruction. I'm gonna show that now on the presentation. Uh, mode. The 
modality of active direct instruction would have been the first example. Uh, the teacher reminds the class about the content, providing direct explanation to the student. Then students engage in an activity where they confirm what they were just told. The activity is fully scripted and instructed by the teacher. The second example as a guided inquiry approach allows uh, students more discretion uh, to engage uh, in the inquiry skills. Students are told to think about how to solve the puzzle of which containers contain iron and which do not. They're not told how to do that. Uh, so the responsibility for coming up with that lies on the students rather than the teacher. So in those two examples, uh, we see the second would be the better fit uh, for being classified as guided inquiry. Well, these were the classroom examples I wanted to share with you today. Uh, again, I wanna emphasize this framework does not have a prescription associated with it. It is not suggesting one modality is best. Other modalities are um, not appropriate or worse uh, approaches, but instead this framework is intended to emphasize that the degree to which students are engaged in inquiry, the steps of doing science, uh, those degrees vary uh, across an infinite spectrum uh, of different levels. This framework emphasizes that notion and I have found it to be quite helpful in reflecting on lesson plan design, comparing uh, different ideas for lesson plans and engaging in discussion with colleagues around curriculum development. And with that, I want to offer a summary and then three um, points of emphasis as a take home message. And then I want to uh, offer any question and answer that uh, that attendees may have today. As a summary, this framework uh, emphasizes that for any given science lesson, the degree of student inquiry should be considered as existing across a continuum. Uh, I've said that several times throughout. Uh, that is the main summary of this framework. And that notion um, is broadly applicable to the teaching of science at any grade level and for any science content area. Uh, inquiry skills should be considered uh, as existing uh, across a, a continuum. Uh, as a take home message, I'm gonna say uh, the, the opposite because this was a misconception that I held. Inquiry-based instruction should not be considered as dichotomous, meaning the way in which we teach science is not either inquiry-based or inquiry-based. There are nuances of what students are doing in a given lesson that are very important to consider. And those considerations uh, should be made and should inform our practices as uh, science educators. Uh, I also want to reiterate uh, that this framework does not carry with it uh, a notion of a prescription of, of what or how a lesson plan should be taught. Open inquiry is not always best or always expected. Many conversations I've had with teachers in the past has suggested that, that this is a misconception, that teachers often feel as if teaching through inquiry implies open inquiry or open-ended student inquiry. And I do not believe that to be true. Open inquiry is not always best or always expected. There can be disadvantages or constraints when teaching through an open-ended inquiry approach. Similarly, didactic instruction is sometimes advantageous. In particular, I can think of scenarios, my background being in chemistry, uh, I can think of scenarios where a given topic has safety concerns to where a didactic demonstration by the teacher is necessary uh, for safety purposes. There are some scenarios where didactic instruction may be the best choice. There are some scenarios where open inquiry may be the best choice. 
in discussions that I've had with the Ohio Department of Education science team, and I believe uh, we may have one attendee uh, joining us today from, from the science team, uh, I have posed this question. Uh, so if we consider this framework and a teacher asks, well, where should my lessons fall? Um, we reached an agreement uh, to the following. If you're considering your curriculum with respect to this framework, a significant portion of a teacher's science curriculum should involve these modalities. Active direct and guided inquiry should represent a significant portion of the science curriculum, not all of it. Didactic instruction is sometimes advantageous uh, and necessary. Open inquiry is sometimes advantageous uh, and in some cases necessary, particularly science fair projects or extracurricular uh, capstone experiences of, uh, of sorts. But if a teacher's curriculum is almost exclusively falling as didactic instruction, there is a risk that students are not being given the opportunity to practice, apply, and therefore develop inquiry skills associated with science. The last take home message is that this framework I have found to be a very helpful for considering how any given lesson plan could be reviewed and revisited for ways in which modifications might allow for targeting specific student inquiry skills. As a visualization to show this, uh, if we just take three of the categories on the framework uh, and separate them, I've uh, just taken didactic, active, and guided modalities. This framework can help to take a look at a lesson or when designing a lesson for the first time, think of where it falls on the spectrum and then small subtle changes that could be made to the lesson plan to convert students from um, doing less of a particular inquiry skill as didactic instruction into doing a little more through, through active instruction or taking a particular component and coming up with a way that you might transition it from active direct instruction into a more guided inquiry approach. When we consider lesson plans uh, involving student inquiry as existing across the spectrum, it allows uh, educators to start to think about, realize, and come up with creative ways for modifying lesson plans uh, that can target specific uh, inquiry skills. And uh, with that, I will wrap up uh, my, uh, my instruction today in sharing this information and, and overview. I hope something I've shared has given you uh, a new perspective or spurred some, uh, some creative ideas. And I hope you'll consider joining us for the next webinar uh, sessions in which we'll, we'll apply some of these concepts and start looking at uh, uh, very specific examples of lesson plans and modifications that can be made in subtle ways to promote an increased uh, amount of student inquiry. And with that, I'll open it up for, uh, for any questions uh, or comments. Uh, attendees who are with us today, if you wanna raise your hand, I would be willing to, uh, to ask a question with your microphone turned on, please be willing to do so, or feel free to use the, uh, the question and answer feature uh, here in the Zoom webinar. And I'll wait just a few moments to give you that opportunity. Uh, and I would ask Mackenzie if, uh, if you're available and see any, uh, any questions or, or comments that I could address, let me know. Otherwise, I, I don't wanna keep all of you on the webinar today. I'll give you back a few, few minutes of your time. I wanna be respectful for the, uh, the tremendous uh, schedules that you're all facing now with, uh, with class, classroom expectations as well as the uh, uh, very unique uh, academic year that, uh, that you're dealing with. Jacob, we have Susan Lehman here. She's gonna oh, okay. be able to unmute herself to ask a question. Excellent. Hi, Susan. 
Hi, Jacob. Uh, thanks for all the great information. Um, I love the continuum and just the, um, the challenge to look, look up, you know, to see if you can give just a little bit more of that autonomy for kids to really do the problem solving and question asking. And I think, um, I think the thing that comes to my mind that I'm wondering is, I'd like to be a better question asker to be better at the Socratic method. Do you have any resources that you recommend that have helped you to become a better question asker or that you know are out there? And the second thing is that I just think of as a high school teacher and um, even this second semester here where I'm, I'm a chemistry teacher too. So I'm trying, how am I gonna do labs with these kids in a half an hour? How am I gonna have time to make sure that they have time to explore these concepts? So the first one is, how do I get to be a better question asker? And the second is, how, how do I work within time constraints where it's so much faster to tell kids what to do, but it's not very rewarding for teachers or kids necessarily? Uh, it, it can be. Uh, there, I, I apologize. I don't have a simple, simple <laughs> answer that could solve all of those challenges. Um, I, I do want to first open it up if any other attendee here today has a resource uh, that they can share either, either through the chat or through the microphone uh, for Susan's question uh, about how to improve questioning skills. Uh, mm -hmm. I would welcome sharing that, that resource. Uh, I do have one that I could share with you that is uh, specific to chemistry. Uh -huh. uh, it is a... Um, a project that goes by the acronym POGL. Are you familiar? This was uh, National Science Foundation uh, effort. Uh, the acronym is Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Based Learning. It's a set of strategies for promoting uh, inquiry skills in chemistry classrooms. And it does include uh, focus on researchable questions, uh, how to identify researchable questions and how to identify uh, non-researchable questions. Um, I have your email uh, through the registration for today's uh, event. If, it if you would welcome this, I could follow up with you uh, and email you those resources. I would love that. Thank you so much. Uh, I do want to ask if, if anyone else has a resource to share in response to Susan's question. I, I would welcome that and would appreciate uh, um, reviewing that uh, as a resource. Uh, Susan, was there uh, anything else? Oh, just the time. Like, how do you, to, to try to give kids, to, like, they need time to experience you know, and to investigate and to explore. And so that just takes longer. So I think I'm realizing this is really more of a skills, it, it's more of a skills-based way to teach than just information-based way to teach, which, I mean, I think I'm learning to let go of some of the information and really focus on the skills that could be more helpful in any class academically, or even just really applicable to real world experience and problem solving. I don't have any resources in mind uh, mm -hmm. to, to share offhand, uh, but I, I uh, will share some ideas by email uh, for mm -hmm. balancing time constraints mm -hmm. and focusing on big ideas mm -hmm. rather than an inch deep and a mile wide approach. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, yeah. uh, necessary due to, to time constraints and curricular demands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we are at 4.30. Uh, I want to be very respectful for all of your time. And I'll say again how uh, elated I am to have uh, your participation uh, today and your attendance. I hope uh, aspects of, of today's webinar were helpful, uh, giving you a new perspective or, or uh, perhaps a new tool that you have in your teaching toolkit. And I uh, want to uh, end with a thank you and my uh, email, feel free to correspond, send me any questions, comments, uh, or needs. Uh, I'll be prompt in following up. And uh, you can expect uh, an email correspondence within the next few days by early next week at the latest. Um, in which you will receive a certificate of attendance uh, for your participation today. 
a copy of today's presentation slides and also a link to a recording of today's presentation. If you want to review any, uh, any aspects of the webinar, uh, this session uh, was recorded and we'll post it, make it uh, publicly available, and I will share a link uh, to the recording uh, as well. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for all that you do. Have a great evening, and I look forward to joining you again uh, in four weeks. Take care.